Okay. Good evening, good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for coming. It's uh, really a pleasure being here, and thank you to BIC for inviting me to share my work and uh, some of my life and experiences uh, with all of you. Uh, it's really lovely being here, and so I thought I'd share an aspect of something that's very dear to my heart. Uh, I started keeping a diary at the age of 12 after reading the diaries of Anne Frank. And that visual journal, oh, it became a visual journal by the time I was 18 when I, I grew up in Bangalore. So uh, there may be little attributes of me that I want to start off with. But over the years, I've been keeping a diary, a sketchbook, a visual journal, if you call it. Uh, and it's now more than 30 years since I've been keeping such a documentation of my life. And what I've realized is these books, now there are more than 300 of these books, and they've piled up. And I can clearly say that they have really affected me in ways that are very profound. And I hope to share some of that with all of you. So uh, without any further ado, I thought I'd start with an introduction of me here. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I grew up in Bangalore, as I said, and I put together a little kind of comic graphic novel thing for the Bangalore graphic novel a few years ago, but it would give you a sense of where I'm coming from since I'm here in Bangalore. So my grandparents came to Bangalore in 1953, and as a Christian family in Richardstown, life was very different then. They lived in a little tile roof house on Viviani Road, and one of my early memories of that space was a candlelight dinner that my grandmother had for my sister, brother, and I. The table was set outside under the moonlight, and my grandmother brought out a delicious soup, which actually had all the letters of my name spelled out in that alphabet pasta in my bowl. So she had actually picked Prashant Gerard Miranda and you know, placed it in the, into the uh, alphabet pasta soup. As dinner progressed, my grandmother enacted stories, transforming her hands into puppets that formed beautiful shadows on the walls by the light of the candle. She was magical, and I grew up with an old world charm of quaint happenings in Bangalore. I was three when my family moved to Bangalore from Kerala, and I lived there from 1978 to 1994. I cycled to school from Koromangla to Museum Road every day. The pace of life was different then. The weather was glorious with nature and trees everywhere. We biked off to wide open fields after school, exploring life by the lakes, trying to solve mysteries, writing notes with invisible inks as all young investigators would. Cobras visited our home while I sat on top of trees doing my homework. Frogs croaked at night and I shivered on misty winter mornings while I pedaled to my morning piano lesson at St. Mark's Cathedral. On lazy Sunday afternoons, lazy Sunday afternoons were spent on the verandas of the Victoria Hotel at family get-togethers, and one would sneak a pint after college at Pico's. Soon, beautiful old buildings started to disappear. The Victoria Hotel became a mall. Trees were cut down. My charming high school, St. Joseph's Boys High School, founded in 1858, was razed to the ground, and a new building came up in its place. My grandparents' home turned into apartments, and the hordes arrived by the million. I left to study in Ahmedabad in 1994, and during my vacations back in Bangalore from design school, I would try to draw some old buildings that still remained. I knew that the days of our home were numbered as my family planned to emigrate to Canada. And the rapid changes in Bangalore seemed to coincide with the changes taking place in my life. But now I return every year and revisit spaces which still have the old charm that I was used to. A beer at Koshi's in the afternoon or a walk through Cubbon Park brings back spectacular memories. Bangalore still has a wonderful essence to it and my old friends and family are reminders of what once was. As I sit on the metro and still see the canopy of the trees, I feel a nostalgia and a sense of anticipation of what the city is becoming. So, um, you know, it just gives you a kind of brief introduction of 
how I grew up in Bangalore, and it's still quite dear to my heart, you know, very many old friends, which are now family, are here with me this evening, and it's very, very, very special because they've all been so supportive in my uh, growing up in Bangalore. I moved to Canada 20 years ago, but I still hold it very dear to my heart. So on to sketchbooks as healing. Now, over the years, you know, these books have documented so many um, different experiences. I mean, some of them traumatic, some of them very emotional, some of them very uh, psychological, some of them physical. And, um, you know, uh, sometimes these traumatic experiences have just been poured out into my sketchbooks. And I find it to be an incredible release to what uh, my life and to see patterns occurring over 30 years. And has helped me recognize a lot of things about myself and how I've evolved and grown as a person. So, you know, um, when 1998, I had an arthroscopy on my left knee at Hosmat Hospital, and then, <laughs> and then 2010, another you know surgery in my right knee, and I think this is one such page because I keep a sketchbook, and I draw in my sketchbook every day. It has become a uh, my best friend, you know, and it's not like it's a precious thing. It's uh, I put all sorts of things, phone numbers, recipes, poems. Uh, all sorts of things go into it. So here it goes, like much pain and circumstances. Uh, please guide me through the right cure, a place of healing to sort out my knees. They are the weakest that they've ever been. Never been here before, <laughs> unless I've forgotten. The great blessings of memory of constant pain right now. Both knees sore, one knee crooked, locked at a 45 degree angle. Can't put too much pressure on it. Tell me, tell me, tell me what to do. I have tremendous faith in my body healing itself. Please help me find sacred healing spaces, faces, traces. But this would actually be what the spread of my sketchbook was. And it's rather whimsical and quite colorful. Don't ask me. I mean, sometimes it's just outpourings that come out of me that you know I'm doing while uh, going through such pain. So one of the first things I want to take you through is my sketchbooks as pain chronicles. And so my knees have been the bane of my existence. I mean, I, I can trace it back to being very young and just having issues with my knees and lots of pain when I was a little boy. And it just seemed to be the reason why I leave Canada for the winters. And I've been doing this for 16 years, but I spend my winters in India and summers in Canada. And the premise being that I've got to get away <laughs> because if I don't, uh, I will die. I've become a migratory bird. And it's very simple. When it starts getting cooler, I just spread my wings, and off I come here. And then when it's getting too hot, I'm like, I'm back, back uh, in Canada. And um, and so you know, so here, operation under a full moon, Jan 30th, room 309. And I thought these are really interesting things to show you because it's closely connected to Bangalore too. Surgery on the home turf. You know, so pain and the meaning of life. I won't go through into the details, but I'm just saying sometimes there are ramblings and extensions of myself that I write about and draw about in my sketchbooks. But here you go. Check myself into room 309 at Hosmat Hospital, 3.30 p.m., a gray room with tube lights, so help me God. <laughs> and uh, that's me reading some Robert Crumb handbook at, on the 29th of January, 2010. But, you know, um, today as I lie on this bed, I ask the universe to guide me. I thank the universe for guiding me as it always has and for bringing me to this moment, which is now. I cannot comprehend the innumerable dreams that have transported me to unknown magical spaces, shown me points of view up in the air, under the sea, resolved quandaries and ushered inspiration, the times when I've been comforted by the warmth of love that seemingly appears out of, out of nowhere and has dispelled darkness with a smile. The generosity of lives lived with a passion to serve, with humility and selfless compassion. I do not know these things, but I'm ever grateful for having glimpsed a speck of this vast and unfathomable, great and kind universe. So, um, you know, 
I mean, a message just arrived that Dr. Chandi can't perform my surgery at 8 a.m. You know, it just has things. The reason why I write these things down is because I'm the most forgetful person in the world, you know. And it has all sorts of things like um, Sandeep Roy and Aarti came to visit me this evening. My old friend Roy is here, whom I've known for 35 years. Um, waiting for surgery, dream, look at that. Nell had organized at 5.30 a.m. <laughs> and I'd, I've been documenting my dreams too, which you'll see. Nell had organized a poetry reading night. I had made the poster, it was in a large house with a fireplace. You know, so things which there's no way I would remember otherwise are now documented for posterity. Um, this would have been some kind of a they am knocked out a cold, sore throat, heavy head and body ache, you know, and then, so I'm just kind of chronicled how I was feeling in the morning, how I was feeling in the afternoon. And they're great reminders of, of things that, you know, in that state, there's no way I would remember this from 10 years ago, let alone last month. But this is amazing, the kinds of uh, portals that my sketchbooks have become into another time frame and another time zone almost, you know. Um, so I just want to show you a flip through of a very profound time in my life in 2012. I did my first artist residency in Assisi in Italy and uh, I spent the month of November in Assisi. And it was a profoundly, profoundly peaceful place and uh, you know, sometimes it's just good to show you how I like, th my sketchbooks are of various sizes and dimensions and shapes. And uh, to give you an idea of, of a flip through is like, you know, I was documenting recipes, uh, the colors of the day. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi was a very uh, simple 12th century mystic is from Assisi, whom I felt like I had a close connection because he was so connected to nature. And I would go mushroom picking, you know, draw the rooftops of Assisi, uh, or paint at night the San Francesco Basilica, making lasagna con fungi, which uh, Adria, the mother, would cook every uh, day for us at the residency. I was super lucky. But also you'll see some of the pages of my sketch sketchbooks are just marks. You know, they're not necessarily image and text, which I usually do. My work usually revolves around image and text as I feel like they complement each other. But sometimes they're just doodles and marks that uh, remind me of that day or the way I was feeling at that point in time. But it was an extremely beautiful time uh, this month because it was autumn. Autumn is my favorite season in, uh, I just love autumn, it's magical. The leaves all turn to yellow and orange and gold and red and uh, it's a time of emotional and physical change I feel and it being my favorite season, there were certain aspects like these pages which was just the rain, it was a rainy day or a windy day and the page just evokes the sentiment of what it was at that time. Um, yeah, so this was my Assisi sketchbook and a few pages while at Rome at the Trevi Fountain and the Colosseum and, uh, you know, while sitting on the Spanish steps and having a glass of wine. So, to sketchbooks as stream of consciousness. Now, for me, as I mentioned, sometimes they are not just documentative of what I have experienced or see in front of me. Sometimes it's just outpourings from the madness in my head. And, you know, it's like, uh, it can be very therapeutic to release that kind of clutter I feel, or sometimes I'm just like, you know, as a kid, I would say in my 20s, I was an angst-ridden young man. I Don't ask me why, but I was. And, um, and so my sketchbooks, definitely, you know, I would write illegibly 
on purpose because I didn't want people to be reading what's going on in my mind. But after a while, I was like, you know what? It's a level of honesty. If someone else can't deal with that page of my life, that's their problem. I'm going to turn the page over, and it's part of my life's book. And that's how it continued. So these are some very early pages from some of my sketchbooks where I just took a blue pencil and drew lines in any which way in my sketchbook. and then rambles out of whatever was out of my head, you know? So, uh, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't make sense at all, but for me, just the act, the simple act of releasing that madness from my head has made a tremendous impact on, on letting things go. Um, connect ions, just using dots and scribbles, which I feel are connections, um, and also portals into different dimensions that I can connect with. Sometimes I've taken my sketchbooks to the symphony, and this was perhaps 2001, 2002. I was lucky enough for three years, three seasons, I went every week to the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, and it was my soul food at night to just go and listen to whatever, whoever was playing. It was really a blessing, but during these times, I would doodle in my sketchbook while listening to music, and I very clearly remember page on the right was while listening to Prokofiev's uh, Concerto Number no. 1. And I would just turn my book around, continue doodling with the music, turn it around, you know, and, and I just kept going. And this takes me back to a very clear winter that I was going through, and just from my drawings, I know this was also a winter in my mind. But um, the drawings and the doodles have just helped me express in ways I would not have otherwise been able to express. Um, again, more of these. And these are just squares and circles, you know? Squares, rectangles, and circles. I mean, if you ask me what these mean, I don't know what it means. But looking back at it, I know exactly what, what time of, uh, of the year I was going through this, what year it was, and it's really special and meaningful to me. Look at this, uh, the 27th of July, 1997. To tell you the truth, it doesn't really matter who the <laughs> I won't bother reading, but uh, you know, this is while studying at NID and going through my usual angst, um, you know, but you can see just from my handwriting and the scribbles that I was uh, quite cluttered and, and you know, so releasing, in 2012 I was part of a National Geographic documentary where I traveled through central India, Madhya Pradesh. And it was really beautiful. And at one point in Chanderi, I think there were these Jain caves with these beautiful relief uh, sculptures of seated meditation, people with flowers in their heart. And I was like, wow, I want to have a flower in my heart. You know, is what I felt when I, when I uh, saw those beautiful sculptures. So this was a time when I was going through a heavy heart, and I think it was just about channeling the inevitable. So sketchbook is meditation. And I think just the act of drawing and writing for me has been extremely therapeutic. It calms me down almost immediately. Perhaps it's my medium of watercolors too, because uh, my life became very, I mean, as I said, I travel, I travel all the time. I've been a nomad, a vagabond for a very long time. And, but I've also been an artist for the last 16 years and I paint for a living. So I had to make my work portable. And so my sketchbooks fit in my bag, my watercolor does. And uh, it's a lovely medium for me because what I do is it dries immediately. I'm not dealing with, you know, carrying around oil, paints, and turpentine, and waiting for it to dry, and canvases, and this and that. Paper, you draw it, you paint on it. I usually use water from that space, which is could be the Ganga in Banaras, or you know the ocean, the sea, a 
uh, I dip it, dip my brush in beer, whatever it may be, rainwater. And I really feel like the essence of that space infuses itself into my paintings. So this is a spread from my sketchbook in Banaras, uh, which is very dear to me. I've spent over a year in all in Banaras. And uh, the, the, yeah, you, I'm going to just share with you how my sketchbooks, or keeping a sketchbook, can be a meditative activity. So um, part of what's, what the sketchbook is, so this is a Banaras sketchbook in 2014-15. Uh, not just Banaras, there's more, like the, maybe Ahmedabad and Goa and Bombay and stuff. But uh, a lot of it has affirmations of love and peace and happiness and friendship and gratitude and reverence and compassion, kindness, generosity, truth, trust, hope, faith, justice, equanimity, healing and protection to all beings in all the universes. And, uh, you know, and goodness and family and these kinds of things I felt over the years have really, laughing <laughs> at bought four groovy langots today. Um, but yeah, you'll see these kind of recurring affirmations in these books, which, um, which I feel help me also. So the scale of this book, as you can see, is much smaller. My friend, who happened to go to a residency in Assisi long after I did, found this. It's a post-war um, book, World War II book, and uh, found it at an old flea market. And I felt like, wow, you're repurposing something else, right? Um, uh, so you can see it's got all sorts of ramblings, phone numbers, uh, readings, you know. Um, so from Banaras to Delhi, Delhi to Goa. <laughs> uh, have some a dear old friend here uh, who's with us tonight and documenting things. So what I was going through that day, the dogs were there, the art of visual journal keeping. Um, Moonset, sunrise, the things I saw, I think it was a python and a lovely golden frog that would visit me in the washroom every day. Um, and magic, I really think, you know, a sunset can be magical, a sunrise can be magical, and the colors I see. And uh, Goa to Ahmedabad, where I was teaching at NID, been invited to teach once again, which has been really lovely then to Bombay, uh, where I was working on a show called Bombay Gold. So these are all sorts of my dreams. Uh, my sketchbooks can be very nascent in terms of ideas and outpourings of things that, ideas for, for my paintings, for my shows, for my animation films, which I hope when we have time, uh, we can, I can share, you, uh, should share with you some of those films too. So meditate, animate, <laughs> my energy feels restrained and I can't wait for it to unleash itself, to pour forth and unravel, to diversify and explode. Meditate in this cave shrine of an ancient tree. I was in the Sequoia National Park and was in the presence of 2,000 and 3,000 year old trees, which is just so special. And some of these trees literally had rooms in them, like caves within the tree that I sat in. Uh, you know, affirmations. And sometimes it just kind of, I've, I've been, you know, that's it, focus on finding my log cabin on the West Coast. And this is like, I've been really looking for a space. I've, I've actually found a wonderful space in the Pacific Northwest of Canada that I'd love to live in. And this was one of my early trips there. I've been going over the last five years and it's just solidified my, uh, my idea or my reasons for wanting to be there. And every year I go and spend more time. I'm heading there at the end of the month. Um, and I just love it there. But there are a lot of affirmations that I've actually put down in my sketchbooks, which I've seen translate into reality, which I find to be really reaffirming in those ways. 
Um, I'm working on another cycle these days. It feels good to meditate, to rejuvenate, rejuvenate the senses, to spend some time in solitude and extend the periphery of love. My first mango of the season. You know, sometimes I also portray feeling if someone's unwell and you, you know, you're thinking of that person and you want them to get better, better, I feel like those elements also translates into my books. This is a friend who wasn't well in Banaras while I was staying there. Taking care of myself, which is just as important because I feel like these, my sketchbooks are aspects of actually they're, they're my personal documentations, you know, but I share them. I've been sharing them for very many years. Since 2006, I had a blog spot that I just put out my sketchbooks till 2016, and now there's an Instagram thing, and I share it on Facebook. But I realize this is definitely a personal journey, and for me, uh, the best thing, as I say, these are my best friends and uh, an integral part of my well-being. Uh, what a rain, these are going berserk. Sleep plus rain equals, rain plus sleep, sneeze equals, and sleep plus sneeze equals. So sketchbooks is dream journals. And so now I've been documenting my dreams for more than 30 years. And there was no way I'd remember these dreams. You know, I mean, it's it's crazy. But I feel so grateful for having just been down, woken up in the middle of the night or whatever, and jotted down um, these thoughts and ideas because very often I do not know what these dreams mean. I have no clue. But years later, and sometimes looking back at them, uh, they make so much of sense to me, you know? I dreamed of whales again. and. I'd never seen an orca when I had this. I am now in the Pacific Northwest a couple of months ago, and my last week there, a pod of orcas came to say bye, bye to me. You know, last year I saw my first sighting of three orcas. I swim with humpback whales. I have a connection with them. Um, and it's really special. And sometimes just by the fact that I've documented down reiterates something that there's no way I can understand, right? How can I? How can I even explain uh, uh, spaces I've seen, you know, or points of view that I've seen, or different kinds of creatures or characters from my dreams that simply blow my mind? But I'm grateful for some of these. Like this is a very this must be a two thousand a twenty year old sketchbook from two thousand. Some fantastic dream last night. Seemed like I was walking from Amme, who was my grandmother's house, to our house on Ashoka Road in Fraser Town. Along the way, so I was in Canada then. Along the way, when I looked around on Palm Road or maybe Hall Road, whatever, I noticed the trees looking like Van Gogh trees. Um, and when <laughs> I looked up at the clouds, they looked like someone had photoshopped Van Gogh clouds on them. It was quite bizarre and intriguing, and the corner of Davis and Ashoka Road, I looked up at the sky once again, and it was a deep blue at the horizon above the white houses, and gradually faded to an aqua with white clouds, and then I noticed turtles swimming in the sky high above me. Could I have been underwater? And you can see that, <laughs> you know, I mean, these are really flights of fancy, but um, you can also see that from my handwriting, like I just like jotted this down at, I don't know what time of the night, but strangely enough, years later after doing this, I worked in the animation industry. So I grew up in Bangalore from 78 to 94. 94 to 99, I was at NID in Ahmedabad. and 99, I moved to Toronto. And from 99 to 2004, I worked in the animation industry. For a time, I traveled around India for six months, backpacked around. But um, I designed animated shows for children for TV. And things like uh, I would animate trailers for an environmental film festival called Planet in Focus. Just so happened that their theme, their logo was a was the Earth on a turtle's back. It was a turtle with the globe on its back. And for their fifth anniversary, I was commissioned to do the artwork and you know things like that. And I ended up animating this turtle, 
And I was, and you know, I did the animation, whatever. It went off to broadcast design, and I remember I wasn't well for a few days, and pulled out the sketchbook, and my friends had sent me this one-minute trailer, and they had kind of ended with the turtle swimming in the sky, and I happened to pull out my sketchbook with this dream in it, and I was like, this is my dream, you know. I mean, without me having realized it. So um, these kind of circumstances, a lot of flying dreams, again, a 2000 sketch, my first year in Canada, and I dreamt of a long hat like that, which was my flying device. And here I go, um, a flying dream, also being able to control my flights of fancy. So I would tip my head down and go up and tip my head back, you know, so I was controlling my flight in the dream. And years later, I went for my first canoeing and portaging trip, which was, you know, five days a week, where you canoe across a lake, carry your canoe, you're carrying your, your transportation, your food, your dwelling space, your tent, your everything, and going off. And the first time I actually put the canoe on my head, my friend asked me, how are you doing? And I said, I'm flying. You know? So yeah, I had a, a canoe dream way before. So these kinds of points of view, sometimes uh, I've been thinking of an idea or a concept. This was one of my design school animation films called Father Balthazar, which I may share with you at the end of uh, this talk. Um, but you know, I'd written the script. I was really thinking about how to translate the script into a visual script, into a storyboard. And I was in Bombay, and at 5 a.m., my storyboard just came to me practically in a dream, and I woke up and I, I did exactly this, and this turned out to be my storyboard, like this was my film, and I, I had no problem animating it after that. So, you know, 30 years worth of dreams and experiences. Saw a baby seal in, a, in an aquarium, not enough space for it, I felt terrible. You know, also it's a lot of dolphin and whale dreams. Um, that I went to Powell River last night. I'm going to move on to um, last year. I mean, I'm going through this quite quickly, so there may be time at the end of this if any of you are interested in seeing some of my other travels and sketchbooks, I can pull them up and we could go through this after my talk, which, um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. So, um, you know, I did a two-week Ayurvedic treatment last May, I think. And uh, I just wanted to show you chronicling this experience for me because I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be doing such a treatment ever again. Um, and just as, a, as purely as a documented thing, uh, these are some of the spreads from that sketchbook, um, 16th May or 14th May. And you know, I mean, I was practicing yoga and my first day's treatment. I often find that first impressions are really important. You know, I mean, I've been traveling to different spaces over the years and I try to immediately document my first impressions because those moments are very fleeting. You know, I mean, a new place that I've gone to, a new town, a new city, uh, I kind of pen down immediately the way I feel, the kind of people I've met, the emotions running through me. Um, and I'm kind of an old-fashioned romantic too. So, you know, if I go to a modern city, I try and find the oldest part of the city and kind of imagine how it was at some period of time and then, you know, start exploring the rest of the city. But uh, I find that first impressions are incredible because sometimes these kinds, of the people you have met uh, turn out to be friends for life. And I have those experiences jotted down in my sketchbooks. And it's, it's just wonderful and heartwarming to go back to those moments. So, you know, some of the hot oil treatments. I, I was there alone. I didn't know anyone. 
Uh, it was more of a retreat, which I really loved. And there was like pre-monsoon last year, the monsoon started early. It was really, really beautiful. Um, this is extraordinary. I'm getting used to this, is what I've pinned down there. Pre-monsoon, what is it? Are underway. Pre-monsoon? I can't see my 44-year-old eyes are terrible. Uh, oh, yeah, renovations. Yeah, yeah, there were renovations. <laughs> because they had to get stuff done before the monsoon. So, you know, tiles were being, uh, you know, new tiles were being placed on the roofs. Thank you. Uh, yoga is beginning to help transform my body. I would do that every morning. Um, I was actually, yeah, last, last year's six months was odd. I was teaching in Ahmedabad and I felt like, you know, I got this really bad cough and then a bad sciatica and this and that. So, hello, I'm old man Prash, because usually in winter I'm really old man Prash and literally at times hobbling around with a cane. So that's how I felt, but it was summer. So um, I can, I, I, that's definitely how I felt uh, when, I, when I checked myself into Ayurmana. But then, you know, these are also some of the pages that I sat with my yoga teacher because I loved the sequence of uh, asanas and exercises she was doing that by the end of two weeks, I felt so much better. And, um, and so I sat with her on the last day and jotted down very quickly, you know, I was like, okay, you can see these are just like stick figure drawings, which I still practice till to today. And fantastic reminders of my sequence of what I should be doing. Um, and it's all part of my sketchbook. So this is one such sketchbook, which, is, uh, which was a transformation for me physically and mentally and spiritually, I would say, um, but a great reminder of what I went through. So I'm coming towards the end of this part of the talk. I mean, and um, I'm a huge fan of nature, you know. If you look at my work, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with my work, but my three major themes are uh, nature, which, is, which inspires me the most, uh, old buildings and architecture, which I love to draw and paint, and, uh, and the human body, and I love the human body, and so the figurative aspect of work. But for me, the most important in all of this is definitely my connection with nature, because I've gotten to a point now in my life where I've got cityitis, I'm allergic to cities, and, uh, and I'm ready to spend more time in nature. I've just reached that point, you know? I mean, having seen Bangalore change so much, but it's not just Bangalore, it's every city in the world. And I, I mean, I, I, there's nothing wrong with cities. All my, I mean, well, cities are more people, more construction, more traffic, and more pollution, and less trees. And I just want to be where there are more trees. So uh, I found a lovely little spot on the west coast of Canada that I'm spending more time with. And so I'm going to end this talk and then show you some of my animation films with uh, some of these watercolors and paintings that I've done in the realm of the gods, where I do hang out with a lot of whales and you know some beautiful old trees. It's full of uh, western red cedars and Sitka spruces and I mean, the, you know, the old growth forests, like sat on the mossy bluffs while with Zoe on Scout Mountain. Gorgeous, stunning day. I'm still so emotional after watching whales last evening, but it's rather exceptional. It's been rather exceptional, and I feel welcome here. The space has a calming effect on my being. And um, so I'm heading back there at the end of the month, and I was there earlier this year for two and a half months doing an artist residency at the Tidal Arts Center. And I love it there. And so I just want to show you my sketchbook from my time 
at the tidal at center in a place called, uh, in the region called Katet, when the, in the local Tla'amen language, Katet means coming together. So this is from earlier this year. I traveled quite a bit. I was in India and then Egypt and then Australia and then I went to the West Coast. Um, my Tidal Arts Center residency begins. Uh, this was an old forestry department building that has been renovated to an artist space. And it's literally the end of Highway 101, which goes all the way down to Chile, South, uh, South America. Um, and I was right by the Pacific Ocean, the water you can see right there is the Pacific, which translates to the Prashant Mahasagar. Um, and I feel like there is a Prashantification that happens when I'm there. Uh, I was right next to Jack's Boatyard, where Lots of sailors from around the world come and fix their boats or park their boats. And every day I was swimming in the ocean, me, the tropical man, uh, right there in the Pacific with gorgeous sunsets. 20 years since I came to Canada. You can see I was working on a children's book, so those were my thumbnails. The moon, which is a major recurring theme. Up on a bluff on Frana Bay, looking out at Vancouver Island. We were at a marine cleanup where we helped clean, clean up all sorts of crazy garbage that we are polluting our waters with. Met some wonderful friends and I really feel welcomed by the community there. Where I did a bunch of workshops, visual journal keeping workshops, children's storybook workshops, watercolor workshops, you know, so there was a lot of community interaction. People hanging out on Divers Rock. Lots of bears, it's a bear country. Mama and baby bear walked in front of me while going to my friend's house for a campfire this June, healing which is what this talk is about. These were the stories I came up with, or the children came up with during their workshop. My little sacred spot, Hernando Island. So the Pacific Northwest is full of all these beautiful Pacific islands, and so I was lucky enough to explore a bunch of these islands. Nando Island, Savory Island, uh, magical spaces. Sailor stories, hanging out with some of the wild sailors at Jack's Boatyard. So that's the Pacific Ocean right at the base of the Tidal Art Center. So I'm going to culminate this talk with a few of my animation films now. Um, uh, these films are just short films. They're three minutes long. And I'm going to start with one of my student films from 20 years ago. and and then show you a couple of other films that I've done over the course of these last uh, 10 years, I should say. 
Um, so these are all hand-drawn watercolor animations. As you know, time animation is a very time-consuming process. Uh, I, 24 frames per second, I get away with eight to 12 drawings a second, and then I, I ink them and I watercolor every frame, shoot them on film. This one was shot on film, and the next one. And, uh, so this one's called Father Balthazar, based on time and memories. Uh, I had malaria in NID and then came back and got a huge relapse here in Bangalore. But a paint blotch on my window in my hostel room looked like a face, and I drew it in my sketchbook, called him Father Balthazar, and then animated this film. Oops, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so this is, you know, a 20-year-old film. <laughs> You know, I mean, you could see also the direct translation of some of my ideas that were clearly in my sketchbooks too, that lent itself to another whole other medium. So a couple more films, and um, uh, I'm going to show you four degrees north of the equator. Uh, so in when I was in Banaras in 2005, I, I came across, the next two films are inspired by trees. And uh, I came across a beautiful old tree which had both neem and people leaves. And I wondered how this single tree could have both these leaves. And the more I researched it, I found out that they actually marry these two trees because uh, people was considered an incarnation of Vishnu, the preserver, and neem, an incarnation of Lakshmi, the goddess of abundance and prosperity. And, uh, and so I, I just, I was inspired by it. You know, it's not a translation. I was just inspired by 
that uh, aspect. And I went to Sri Lanka the following year and just kind of wrote the script down. And the National Film Board of Canada gave me a little seed grant and uh, the Ontario Arts Council gave me a finishing grant. So this is four degrees north of the equator. Thank you. So one more little film that was again inspired by a tree, and this one's called In Memory of the Northern Red Oak. That was, uh, I saw a beautiful old red oak that was, it's native to Ontario, being cut down in Queen's Park in Toronto, and Lift, the liaison of independent filmmakers of Toronto, uh, invited me for their 30th anniversary to to make this film that I shot on 16mm. So it's called In Memory of the Northern Red Oak. If we lose this forest, if we savage the land, we might as well be cutting off our own right hand. For we and the earth are one under the moon, under the sun. If we lose this forest, if we savage the land, we might as well be cutting our far own right hand. For we eyes, the earth, the one under the 
Thank you. So, yeah, this is, you know, I mean, all of these, I think there's a lot of healing that has happened for me through my books and through my sketchbooks and these visual journals and uh, how they've translated into other mediums. And uh, I just feel like there's a lot that can be done for us and our planet, which needs a lot of healing. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to do my uh, third tree film called Trilogy that I've just sent off uh, a proposal for and I hope that, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know how funding comes for these things, but uh, part of what I've been begun to do as part of my artistic life is uh, there are issues that I feel strongly for, whether it's education and literacy or children's programming or, um, or uh, you know, literacy, women's education, trees in the environment, indigenous rights and issues, gay rights, you know, I mean, all of these things I feel strongly for and it's coming through my work in some way and uh, uh, I just, uh, it gives me pleasure that I'm able to share a little bit of this with all of you. So thank you so much for coming. Shared from the heart. Right. Um, so it would be great if there was an opportunity to learn from you uh, a day or so. But when, when do you plan to do a workshop in sure. Bangla? Yeah, well, there are no plans. I actually was invited for a children's literature festival earlier this year. So I did a bunch of workshops for kids. And there was a visual journal keeping workshop, which was open to whoever. Um, uh, this was just last year, uh, last month. Uh, in Bangalore, but I'm heading back to Toronto in, a, in less than a week. So I doubt there's going to be anything. There may be a drink and draw session tomorrow. <laughs> uh, Sunday, somewhere in Kormangla, which I do not know, but maybe there'll be an Instagram post if anybody wants to uh, drink and draw tomorrow afternoon. Um, but I'm part of an online sketchbook school and uh, this was started five years ago by my friend in New York, Danny Gregory, and his friend Kershaw from Amsterdam. And uh, I was for their first course called Beginning, they invited six sketchbook keepers from around the world to do six classes, and I was one of them. So it's, I'm just in the first course, and it's a lovely, lovely, lovely online portal to introduce yourself to visual journal keeping. Um, and it's called sketchbookschool.com, S-K-O-O-L. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just did like these little videos, one in Banaras, handheld, why I started keeping sketchbook 25 years ago, uh, what continues me to do it, and you know, I mean, various aspects of it. I did a watercolor demo in Goa, uh, because it was perfect for sky, sea, and sand. And then I, in Bangalore, a little video of a flip through of one of my sketchbooks heading to my family hometowns in Manapad and Tutukuran in Tamil Nadu, deep roots in the deep south. But uh, that's another way that you could introduce yourself because from that course, they've moved on to playing and ways of seeing and storytelling. And there are so many different uh, courses that 
amazing uh, artists from around the world have taken, so, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Th thank you for sharing with us. My pleasure. I have a question regarding the healing. Yeah. I don't know how to draw. Yeah. Can it be a healing for me? Absolutely. Because what I found here, yeah. it's so beautiful <laughs> that we think of, oh my God, I will never be able to do that kind of thought, you know? Right. Uh, so maybe, maybe. Um, Convey a little bit more sure. of the freedom of just... Yeah, I come the from the, you know, I mean, we all drew as kids. So when you say I can't draw, I, I don't believe that. You know, each one of us drew as children. It's just that it's a practice. And I have drawn every day for, of my life since, I mean, I would say definitely for the last 30 years, but since I was a kid. And it just requires that practice. For me, I, I, I say three Ps, you know, passion. If you're passionate about it, practice. You've got to just do it. Keep a sketchbook and doodle. As I say, it's not about making beautiful drawings. Sometimes it's just making a mark. If you find something, stick it in a matchbox, a piece of paper, whatever, and write about it. And perseverance. When you feel like you can't do it anymore, you do it some more. You know, and that develops a practice that you will see results. And it is people like you who have joined Sketchbook School, and there are thousands of people around the world now, and I have seen the progress. It's been five years since I did the first course, and, you know, there's a global community of people doing this. So it's not someone who, you know, has, I mean, people who have been picking up a pen and a pencil or a paper after many years. But it just requires that kind of a practice. And uh, I don't think, you know, all artists are our own worst critiques. Anybody can be really harsh about anything. You know, you've got to shut that monkey and, and just do it. And, and then, you know, it's, it's not for us to say how good or bad the drawing is. It's more of a release. Uh, that I feel is more important, you know? And then if you feel like sharing it, you share it. And, you know, because for the longest time I had my sketchbooks under my bed and on, a, on my bookshelves at home and I wasn't sharing it and then started putting it on a blog spot and I didn't realize how much of an audience I, I didn't know how many people would come this evening, you know? But um, I feel like it starts off with that and uh, it's become part of my practice. But I can definitely say it's been really helpful for me. Yeah. Hi, this is Varun here. Thanks Hi. for the great talk. My pleasure. So my question is, when you sketch, would you keep a photograph for reference or would you look at the live scene and sketch? I mostly do that. Yeah, I mostly do my sketches right then and there if it's something I'm observing and draw drawing. Uh, but I'm also an artist and I take commissions for paintings and, you know, people from other parts of the world send me a image of their child or their cottage that they want painted or whatever and then I work from a photograph, of course, because I'm not there. But um, not all of my sketches are documentative in that way. Sometimes, you know, I'm sitting at the bar and having a beer and just uh, <laughs> a stream of consciousness drawings or the whimsical madness in my head I kind of try and put out in a different way. So, yeah, but a lot of it, I would say, would be a documentative reportage kind of uh, way of chronicling my life. Uh, hi, my name hi. is Kavya, and hi. Uh, first of all, I need to tell you that this session was so, so, so good. And Thank you. Uh, all your sketchbooks were fantastic. <laughs> uh, I actually have two questions. The first one is, um, how has your thought process evolved over 30 years of you doing the journaling? Like, mm. when you were a kid, uh, I remember you said you mm -hmm. drew what you came, uh, what you dreamt of. Mm. But now, what do you consciously 
put in certain things in your journal or what is your thought process? That's my first question. Yeah. My second question. Uh, the second question is, you mentioned that you have 300 note, uh, journals or sketchbooks. Where do you keep them? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so to answer your first one, almost certainly my, my work has evolved over the last 30 years. You know, I mean, if, by starting from written diaries, dear diaries, after reading the diaries of Anne Frank, it moved to keeping a visual journal. Um, uh, and... I didn't know at that time that image and text, juxtaposing image and text was something that I, I'm really drawn to, which is why I also illustrate children's books. You know, I mean, there are ways that this kind of merging of image and text is how I feel makes for a good uh, communication of ideas. But it most certainly has, and just by keeping these books, I can go back to a sketchbook five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years, 25 years ago, I would say, because early ones were mostly written and see a kind of chronological evolution of my work. I most certainly didn't have a style when I started. Um, I explored all sorts of mediums. There's crayons and, you know, I mean, I could uh, pull out references of uh, some of my early works where, oops, yeah, maybe. You know, I mean, uh, let me see if there are, um, you know, my sketchbooks in themselves have, have really uh, changed. Like these were matchbook, matchbox covers that I had that I made into a book. Or I would bind leather or I'll have um, tiffin boxes and things where I would, like a sketch box was a wooden box that I just put pages of paper that I ripped and was my sketchbook. So, you know, I mean, this was in Bangalore in 96 when my dad had a multiple bypass surgery, you know, whatever, 23 years ago. And uh, it's color pencils and paper. Uh, he's 85 now and in good health in Toronto. But I'm so grateful for that time for having documented those 10 days in the hospital, you know. So, see, these are just oil pastels. So these are some of my early explorations of some of my sketchbooks unruled pages, nothing really like, um, you know, these were actually my writings, my dear diary writings from 1998, um, which were just mundane jottings down of my life then uh, in Koromangla. 1996, you know, exploration, G's my knees, which you can see is the recurring theme but various explorations with ink and bleach, um, you know, all sorts of kinds of, uh, uh, there has been an evolution. It wasn't like I could get my proportions right of the way I drew people before. This was me drawing my school, St. Joseph's School, before they knocked it down. And I'm so grateful for having a little memory of that space that I have drawn, you know? from 1996 while sitting across the play field. Uh, my dog at that time with color pencil. So the work has uh, most certainly evolved. Um, and to answer your next question, uh, these books are housed at my parents' home in mm -hmm. Toronto. <laughs> and uh, they continue to pile up. Um, it's, I don't know, you know, it's there. A few years ago, light, it's, these are townhouses, and lightning struck two houses down from us and burnt five houses down and stopped at our house. So I'm not going to bury these uh, <laughs> 300 or more sketchbooks. They're there, but, and I continue, I most certainly haven't documented very many of them, but, um, uh, but yeah, they just continue to to grow as a library of books. Yeah. Well, congratulations to your documentation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry, would you, can I come on? Yeah, so uh, my question is, for someone who's developed such a highly individualistic observational style, I'm curious to know what's your mojo as a teacher? 
I'd love to know your role as, because you're, uh, I, I think it's across age profiles you taught at NID yeah. and you're uh, working with children. Yeah. So what's your mojo as a teacher? Well, I am an eternal student, you know. I mean, I, I, I feel like from any aspect of my teaching, my teacher's teaching has also evolved thanks to amazing friends here. And my friend Lisa has introduced ways of teaching or involved me with children at a very, very young age. And, you know, there were neighbors in Bangalore who kind of recognized um, aspects of my creativity here, Nina and Ram, you know, a lot of old friends and family here who've encouraged my art at an early age. And I feel like um, the sharing aspect is one thing that has helped me. It's just about sharing. Uh, that has helped, you know, at one point, I think someone asked me, are you a sage on a stage or a guide on the side? And I said, I'm both, you know? And so that would kind of uh, describe my style of teaching because there are times when you have to be this crash and, you know, talk to people and inspire and try and get things going. But very often I just have to kind of pull back and observe and let people do their thing because I'm learning most certainly in the process. Uh, that's a primary thing. Uh, you know, going back to NID, I, I was invited to teach after 20 years of me studying there. And I didn't know if I was a student or a teacher. And then in the end, I was like, they've given me a repeat in the color course, but they're paying me now, you know, because I was like, I'm learning color in a whole new way. Like, you know, 20, <laughs> 25 years later, I'm like, whoa. You know, I'm like, I didn't learn that in color. Most certainly I had, you know, and... Uh, or whatever, space, form, and structure, because every time I go back to teach, the way the, the structure of the course is also different. You're teaching the same concepts, but the way it's structured around is different. So, I mean, when I walk into a classroom, I don't think I can teach anything the same way twice, you know? You just kind of improvise as you go along and you wing it, and because, for one, with kids, they are the most creative people in the world, and they're so spontaneous and so innocent and so, uh, yeah, incredible that, I mean, I end up learning so much just by being and observing and seeing them do their thing. I mean, you basically let them do their thing. <laughs> you know, I mean, earlier this year in, uh, at the Tidal Arts Center, I was working with children's storybooks and a little wilder was six years old and the stories that he came up with made them do five sentence stories and, his story was the stinky sock. And it was just like the best story. And I got them to illustrate their little books. And it's like, you know, um, yeah, incredible learnings for sure. Yeah. I wanted to ask if um, sharing your work has also helped in healing as part of the process, and if so, how? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I really believe that uh, in order to be selfless, you have to be selfish. And I've learned to take care of myself or start to take care of myself in a way because when I don't have the energy to give or to share, then I just know that it's not meaningful to, the, to whoever it is around me. So I've learned that, like, through this, you know, Sketchbooks as Healing is taking care of myself in a very basic level that initially I didn't know I was doing. I was just doing it unconsciously or subconsciously. Uh, but it has become a thing. I never knew that people would be flying me around the world to talk about my sketchbooks, you know. Um, we had the world's first sketch con, sketchbook convention in Pasadena, California, last November that they flew me down to talk about my work. And I actually presented a initial avatar of sketchbooks as healing as part of this too, and uh, the art of sketchbook memoir. But I can most certainly say that by that it being a therapeutic aspect for me, I can, I didn't know that it had an impact on others, but now I've started getting feedback. And that is quite heartwarming because perfect strangers have sent me lengthy letters just saying, you know what, this is what your work has done to me. Or, you know, I, I mean, I've started getting feedback and 
I, I didn't know that was the case, but um, it is a very, art is a very powerful medium. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think I've gotten introduced to it by volunteering. I was part of World Literacy Canada, which raised funds in Canada for literacy programs for women and children in and around Banaras. And from 2005, I'd go and volunteer in these little villages. And purely through my art, you know, you realize, okay, there's some kind of change taking place. There's some kind of difference taking place at a very minuscule level. But it has been meaningful. And in that way, I feel like there's a beautiful exchange that happens that's kind of filling my being in a way. And in the same way, then I have more that I can share. Yeah, it's um, right there. Oh. I've got the mic here. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm amazed about this oxymoron sketch journal. Yeah. You know, you're marrying creativity and order. Mm -hmm. How do you sequence this? Uh, how do you let them coexist? Okay. You so, you know, I mean, a, a journal needn't just be about text and order. You know, I mean, a journal, the way you write a word some kind, sometimes can be the most meaningful aspect of a page. So what I'm saying is, you know, I mean, it's not uh, translating. For me, it started, I mean, the word journal, my first, in 2013, I published a, a book of three of my sketchbooks called Journey, Sojourn, Journal. And the journey being the word. And I think journ, journal is a journey. You know, it is. It is, you're taking a trip, you're taking a flight of fancy. It's n a journal I wouldn't relate to order at all. It is uh, an exploration. And uh, I think having a visual aspect of that uh, exploration is like, it's an easy kind of, you know, a visual journal is a visual journey to me. And in that regard, yeah. Yeah. It's just a practice. I think, you know, cooking is a practice, as is swimming or gardening or, uh, I don't know, a anything I think is a practice. Playing piano is a practice, and you're not going to be playing that tune if you haven't practiced, <laughs> you know, the, the journey. The journey is the destination. And I think everything is a practice. I mean, you're seeing the diarizing aspect that I wrote every day. It's just a practice. It's a practice of writing, it's a practice of drawing. And that, and that leads to something else, you know, that leads to a body, work, body of work that's completely different. But I, I really believe that, yeah, it's just a practice. <laughs> yep, there's one right at the back and a few more. That one yeah. came. Uh, this side, the, please. Oh, oh. Yeah. okay, oh, sorry, okay. Hi. <laughs> um, I wanted to know your opinion upon, as an artist, um, each day you go through various visuals. You Pardon absorb me? various visuals to absorb things, yeah. you know, that you can produce in your artwork somehow. Yeah. Do you feel um, as the time goes, those things does have uh, some inf amount of influence in the form uh, you're creating? For sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah, you yeah. are taking inspiration, yes, but then maybe the color palette you're taking or the strokes you're making. Absolutely, you know. Consciously I mean, or unconsciously. Yeah. The way I drew a tree 20 years ago has evolved just by the practice of drawing those trees over and over and over again. And I think by doing that, there is a simplification of form that happens, a simplification of ideas. Of, you know, I mean, it's bec uh, it becomes a style. But it is through that observation and a constant practice of drawing. It's not like I've, you know, just whipped it out. Yeah. No, it's hard work. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> who paints for a living? Mad people, I'm clearly a madman. But um, it's, uh, it's just hard work. It's hard, hard, hard work. <laughs> you know, when you feel like you can't do it again, you do it some more, that's it. <laughs> 
Yeah, right at the back. Ooh. Hi, sir. Hello. Sorry, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Preksha, and um, oh, my question was, how do you develop your own style? How and when did you develop your own style? I haven't developed my style. I think my style developed me. Um, it, 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 it's just an evolution over the years of using a particular medium, you know, a pen on paper with watercolors. And uh, by the fact that I have been having a traveling lifestyle, you know, using this kind of medium has been perfect for me. And it's been quick and efficient and drying and turn the page and I work small. Um, there are various influences in my life for sure. I have, I've had tremendous influences of artists, children's books, illustrators, you know, you name it. Uh, huge, huge, huge influences over very many years that have and added to what my style is. Um, but it's just been over a gradual period of time. The, the, the guy behind you, yeah, he was. Okay. Hi, Prashant. Hello. Uh, yeah, this is Abdul. Uh, the first thing that really intrigued me was the way you told that uh, portraying these things on your sketchbook really helped you let it go. Yeah. And uh, my question uh, regarding that is the animation pictures that you showed us, yeah. like the four degree north of equator, and uh, uh, the frames were moving one by one. So for all those frames, you drew the picture for each frame, or it was? Yep. Yes. For each I tell people not to blink in my film because if you blink, it's one month of my life that's <laughs> yeah. gone. <laughs> it's gone. You have to watch all my films like this. Yes, it's every so, so. frame <laughs> that I've drawn and every frame that I've watercolored and shot. Yeah, hard work. It's really incredible. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> There's a gentleman right at the back, so he's been waving out for a very long time. Okay, sure. Okay. Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, first thing, have you explored digital art by any chance? Like, what do, you, what do you feel about it? What are your views? Oh, digital art's amazing, you know? I mean, it is. Uh, but, as, uh, but it is, again, uh, a tool. It's a tool, it's a means to an end. Uh, it's just that I feel comfortable. I mean, it doesn't mean that I don't use a computer or whatever. I mean, I, I, I haven't had a phone number for 17 years, you know? I mean, I've gotten a device where I can shoot my watercolors now, and when I'm connected to Wi-Fi, I upload it onto Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And that's a fantastic tool. I mean, now uh, I've been in some remote place and shot my watercolor and sent it off to a magazine to be printed, you know, in terms of, uh, in this age, you know, in this technological age, I think it's fantastic. But I, I'm, I'm personally not a fan to be drawing, you know, I mean, this is something that I love to do in terms, of, I'm passionate about painting, the actual physical aspect of putting pen to paper. But uh, who knows? I mean, I can't wait to explore animating on a device, and which is going to simplify a lot of my work in the future. So yeah, I'm op most certainly open to it. And uh, could you share some of your, like, show some of your early doodles or early works where you were just beginning? That that those are the ones that I showed you. <laughs> um, those are the ones I have right now. Uh, but. Yeah, I could show you one more from 1998. Um, I mean, a few more from... Um, this was while in 1998, so this is like 20 years ago. Um, you know, rough sketches. Dreams, my flying pillow dream. I'll take it. I'll take you through these quickly. So, you know, I mean, nothing crazy, but these are friends of mine sitting in the hostel and uh, a trip to Goa. <laughs> um, the Oxbury cameraman. So these are definitely studies. You know, for me, my they're study books. Very often, my sketchbooks are study books. 
they, and I think the studio, com the word studio also comes from study or uh, they help me observe, they help me understand many things that, it's also spending that much amount of time which I feel like a photograph is such a fleeting glimpse of things. It's just like, but, but by the fact that I keep, uh, spend that much time observing details, um, it changes, you know. You, you are forced to look at details and characteristics of what a nose looks like or what that leaf translates into. And uh, yeah, so these are some from my 20 years ago and it's all mostly, I had a bunch of color pencils and my pen and here, Bangalore, Koshi's, that's an early drawing of 9th May, 1998. Anybody else? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so first off, uh, thank you so much for inspiring me. Uh, 2010, I happened to stumble across your uh, Four Degree North video on YouTube. Okay. Uh, I remember bookmarking it and keep going back to it over the years. Uh, spent a lot of time on your blog as well, I completely remember that. And uh, when I joined Instagram, the first thing I remember doing was to search for your account and following that. So <laughs> yesterday morning when you put up that post of doing this, I knew I had to come. Thank so you. thank you so much for inspiring me. Uh, now coming to the question, uh, this is from a more professional art point of view, right? Mm -hmm. So I have been also doing a few commissions over a period of time now. Yeah. Now the idea is art as uh, a self exploration versus art as a product. Mm. How do you really put a tag or a price tag to it? Now that's something <laughs> even I'm, uh, it's been a while I'm tackling with that. How do you put a price to a piece of art that you make? That's the uh. question. You know, I mean, I, I really don't have an answer for that question. You can't, you know. I mean, you really can't put a price because, uh, yeah, I pour my soul out into a little postage stamp painting and, you know, somebody could pick it up for one rupee because it's a one rupee size postage stamp. And uh, it's like my entire existence has gone into that postage stamp. And, uh, you know, but uh, the way the industry, as the art industry is different from art in its essence, because I subscribe to art. Very many indigenous communities do not have a word for art. It's how they dress, it's how they dance, it's how they cook, it's how they eat, it's how they decorate their homes, it's how you walk, it's how you comb your hair, it's how you, you know, put flowers in your house, like whatever, that's art. And I really do subscribe to that notion of art. You know, it's just not one thing, it's how you sing, it's how you put your kids to sleep. It's, it's everything. So, you know, art is a way of life. And so to try and put a price on it is ridiculous. But when one has to make a living out of it, you figure out ways of, uh, putting a price on certain things as you feel it's a completely personal thing. And I would say after, you know, 16 years of doing it, I realized that's not five minutes of my work, that's 44 years of my life, Absolutely. you know, that I've put into it. It's really, it's that much years of practice and uh, that much I think I can, I can, you know, relate to putting a price. Thank you. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. <laughs> I think one last question. Oh, uh, sorry, I couldn't hear. My oh. question. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Oh. Hi. Hello. So my question is: um, Have you ever struggled raising an A thought. <laughs> Have your so the or thing your is cutting on and off. Uh, th thought change. What? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want this mic? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So my question was: uh, Have you ever struggled with chasing an impulse before it dissipates? Let's say you got an idea of uh, sketching out something. Absolutely. And let's say you don't have your tools or. Uh, sketchbook nearby, For and sure. then the idea dissipates. 
So have you ever struggled with like chasing that particular All influence? All the time. Like, like how, do you, how, do you tackle, <laughs> how do you tackle that? Just that's, it's practice again, you know, like because I like, know when I... How do you go I, back to that mental space and, you know, fetch that idea back in? I must say it's gotten easier yeah. after 30 years of practicing, you know, because pursuing a dream is exactly that. Before you know it, it's unraveling. Before you, I can even think it's, it's going. And to try and capture some little essence of it. For me, my work's not about capturing the reality that I see in front of me. It's about capturing an essence, a little whiff of that which will remind me and take me back to that space and time. And that's what I feel is magical about you know, drawing or writing because a little squiggle and now it's more of that translation now between mind and hand and, you know, brain and hand, which is purely practice. And then the other aspects that go, goes on, which, are, which is more, there's m more to it. Uh, you know, because sometimes I can stare at a blank piece of paper and, and a line appears to me and then I just follow that line because, and that I can't explain. But I would say that the practice of doing it uh, which is primarily what I've been wanting to do. How efficiently can I translate that thought or idea to a pen and paper? And that's taking time and I'm still learning and I would love to, love to learn some more about it, for sure. <laughs> we can take one more question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, Um, hi, Prashant. Hello. So uh, my question is, uh, some of your work from the earlier part and then, uh, you know, sort of going over the years, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of connection between nature and, like you said, nature, people, and places. For sure. Places, right? That, mm. Architecture, so, buildings, yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of um, focus on sort of the, it's like almost the divine masculine is sort of, you know, coming into place. Okay. So how has this, he, has this healed you physically and spiritually? Have you sort of, uh, because you said your knees was a, you know, so that was something that I sort of understood because yeah. uh, your physical sort of, you know, will help you through your work and then sort of the healing that has taken, right. you know, into right. process. Right. So has it helped you physically and how has it helped you uh, spiritually maybe? I mean, that's my question. For sure, it has helped me physically. You know, I mean, by... Are, are your knees better? Are, are they... <laughs> I'm walking, I'm standing, um, um. <laughs> I'm doing good. Yes, yes, I'm definitely doing good. Um, uh, I think, you know, by the aspects of translating, I would say, how can you translate an emo emotion of pain? First of all, mm. pain is so relative. Like, I don't know what someone else's pain is, right? I mean, how can you even quantify pain? It's, it's so relative to different people. Mm. So I don't know, I mean, uh, there are some days when I've pushed my body to a level where I cannot move out of my bed when I know, okay, that must be bad. But maybe it's not bad to someone else, like, <laughs> that must be nothing, I don't know. Um, and in that regard, translating that pain into a drawing or into a writing or into a sketch, helps alleviate a lot of that. It does, for me. Uh, you know, and, or it could be an emotional thing. You know, I mean, like my mind could be really cluttered, and I sit to do a peaceful watercolor by the beach. I'm like, I'm a happy man by the end of it. So, and that's pretty much, I mean, I'm not saying it's just sketches. I'm sure if you sat down, if you sat to meditate for a little while, that would help you, and I am a meditator, and I would definitely say that it has helped me become a more peaceful, my name is Prashant, translates to peace, a Pacific, and uh, I most certainly wasn't a peaceful man yeah. 20 years ago. Earlier work, yeah. yeah, like you said, the but a lot of through this practice, I can definitely say I've become a little bit more peaceful, and a little bit happier in the process, and a little bit more positive, and a little bit more hopeful. And uh, that's what I would like to continue in the direction of. 
and whether it has helped me spiritually. I think I've always been a spiritual sure. ilk. Yeah. It comes a lot across, especially the yeah. uh, SEC and, you know, nature. And right. Everything yeah. integrating. Yeah. I'm definitely, I mean, I w I'm not a, a religious person, person but yeah. I'm, I'm a spiritual ilk. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant.